GLC is now offering a free audio stream of our 24-7 broadcast that we're calling GLC Radio, an online radio station that broadcasts our round-the-clock audio stream on a variety of platforms. GLC Radio gives you the ability to listen to GLC virtually anywhere, through your home or office computer, or on the go with a mobile device. You can access GLC Radio through our website or by searching for God's Learning Channel through iTunes Internet Radio, TuneInRadio.com, or on Shoutcast.com. Explore various GLC Radio-enabled mobile apps by visiting our website at glc.us.com forward slash listen forward slash GLC Radio. GLC Radio, your free connection to GLC anywhere, anytime. Welcome to Update. I want to welcome the viewers of Cable One back on the air. Should be here the time you see this tomorrow evening. And who you got sitting down there? Our very special Jean-Claude. Without his little French boots, they burned in the fire. Uh-oh. Pleased <laughs> to be here. You know, I, I have to say that um, the news has just really been full of everything that happened in Paris on Friday night. Mm -hmm. Those horrible, horrible attacks. And I got a message from Jean-Claude Saturday morning, actually. Mm. And uh, he was asking me if I remembered him telling me something that he had told me about France. I said, yeah, in fact, I had reminded mom and dad about that this morning. And I don't think it's any accident that God had preordained you to be here. Yes. So we're going to be talking a little bit about that after Good. we get through some of this initial stuff. Mm -hmm. And we're really glad to have you safely in the I house with us. I am very glad to be here. Blessed. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, and one of the reasons that we love for Jean-Claude to come at the Limb Chocolates, he always brings them from Las Vegas. That's why you keep me coming back that's, here. That's, that's right. That's he brought them the first time he came in. Yeah, made it's, in Las Vegas. It's like his insurance. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell Dr. Scott. Thanks. Okay, so we have a letter. Yes, I've got a letter, and uh, let's let John Claude read it, okay? It's John Claude. Hey, it's good. Well, dear GLC, I'm happy to hear about your raindrop giving because I'm on a limited income. I'm a caregiver for my dad, 96 years old, and I'm afraid he's not yet saved. We always went to Catholic church, but I served less than two years in prison and there listened to the gospel radio daily. I got saved at, in 1999 at 45 years of age. Since then, I tried telling my family, but they say they are staying Catholics. Now, since my dad is in my care, I'm trying to think how to help him have faith. Please pray for him and my daughter, who is 38. I always learn from you and all enjoy every program, especially when you teach about Israel and the Jewish people, and even to Cowboy Dan. I love it all. <laughs> I'm praying for my Apache reservation, people who are into alcohol and drugs, homosexuality, suicide, and so much jealousy. Keep us in prayer, and I'm sorry I can't send more, but you're teaching me. I will send $7 monthly. Thank you for your GLC television programs. Edith from Mescalero, New Mexico. Isn't that something? What a fabulous letter. That's right. You know what, Edith? You just can't even it. imagine how you blessed our socks off. That's right. No, That's you know, right. as we've been going through all of this transition stuff, this, this hit me as I was listening to Jean-Claude read that. As we've been going through all the, trans, the transition of going off of the SES satellite. And I told everyone how the Lord had told me when we were live on the set during Roundup that he set GLC up the way he did so that the people would understand that they are responsible for the truth. Because where else are you gonna get this kind of truth? And he's like, it's their responsibility, Amy. Truth is their responsibility. So truth is the responsibility, not only of each one of us sitting up here, not only of every crew member that we have, but it's the viewer's responsibility as well. And Edith, you got that. You mm -hmm. got it. Mm -hmm. So hallelujah, 
Hallelujah. We are, we are thrilled to have you as a Raindrop partner. And we're so glad to know that you're learning things. That's right. Amen. It's amazing. Well, Mom, what about you? Do you have a devotion? I do, and it, it's to help you not be fearful. And it's called, Get a Good Night's Sleep. Uh, it's from Psalm 121.4. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. On late Friday evening, as terrorist attacks broke in Paris, I couldn't help being reminded of a story that took place in World War II. During the Battle of Britain, the German Luftwaffe rained down about 35,000 bombs upon London during nightly air raids, causing terrifying fear and tremendous destruction and mayhem in large parts of London. For months, as sirens wailed out warnings of approaching German bombers, the general population automatically hurried toward the nearest air raid shelter. People learned to look out for one another during the nightly raids and the morning after walk bouts and cleanups. After a terrible night of bombardment, an elderly woman was not seen in a certain neighborhood for several days. Her neighbors assumed she had either been killed by the falling bombs or her, that she had gone to the countryside to escape the danger and the disruption of life and incessant noise. Sometime later, a neighbor, a neighbor spotted the elderly woman walking down the street and articulated his happiness that she was alive and well. It's nice to see you back, he said. I've not been away, she replied. Well, where have you been, he asked. I've been at home, she said. What have you been doing at home during the air raids, inquired the neighbor. Sleeping, she answered. How could you sleep with all that noise and explosions, he asked. Oh, she replied, I was reading my Bible and found Psalm 121.4, where it declares that God doesn't slumber nor sleep, so I thought there's no point in both of us staying awake. As the world gets more chaotic during these last days as fear abounds, may the Lord grant you the ability to rest in Him, for truly He neither slumbers nor sleeps as He watches over you. <laughs> Very good. Oh, nice. Thank you. It is good. And we do need to constantly encourage ourselves in the Word. And if you have trouble falling asleep, pick up your Bible and oh, read yeah. it. That'll always put, you to, put you to sleep. It does, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Yes, it does. You know, it, it's a combination, it's I think, of um, relaxation and comfort. Of, of the comfort of the Lord and the devil throwing up his hands and going, <laughs> oh, forget it. <laughs> Okay, so we have just one article before we um, start visiting with Jean-Claude about France. And it comes from four different articles, two different sources, Israel National News and the Times of Israel. On Friday, in an attack believed to have been carried out as a planned ambush with the terrorists lying in wait on Route 60 near Hebron until they identified a vehicle filled with Israeli civilians Rabbi Yaakov Lippmann and his 18-year-old son, Netanyahu, were fatally shot. Arab terrorists, traveling in a car with a Palestinian Authority license plate, overtook the car of the Lippmann family, who was driving to an event to celebrate the upcoming wedding of their eldest daughter. The Palestinian terrorist opened fire on the car, raking it with bullets. After being fatally wounded in the initial burst of gunfire, the 40-year-old uh, father, the driver of the car, swerved into the opposite lane where the car crashed into rocks by the side of the road. After the victim's car ground to a halt, the terrorists attempted to confirm their kill by firing repeatedly at the car after it ground to a halt. 18-year-old Netanyahu Littman tried to call rescue services but was then also shot dead by the gunman who got out of his car to fire more shots into Littman's vehicle. Incredibly, Netanyahu's 16-year-old brother, who suffered a gunshot wound to his leg, managed to call emergency services as the attack took place and informed them of the precise location even while shots were still being fired. At that point, the terrorists fled northward. The mother and three young daughters, aged 12, 9, and 5, were lightly wounded, suffering mostly from bruises and shrapnel injuries. All the injured victims were evacuated to a hospital in Beersheba. The father and son were laid to rest 
Saturday night in Jerusalem amid scenes of immense grief. On Sunday, it was further revealed that one of the terrorists actually opened the back passenger door of the car after peppering with, it, with bullets and came face to face with the family's 12-year-old daughter, Mariah, who shouted, no, the terrorists did not open fire and security forces are investigating if this was a result of his weapon jamming. Mariah's cousin, Rabbi Mordecai Antebi, recounted her terrifying ordeal to Rachette Bet Radio. He added that Mariah immediately recognized the terrorist picture when she was shown a lineup of five suspects by Shin Bet security personnel. Well, on Saturday night, the Israeli Defense Forces arrested Hebron resident Shadi Ahmad Matua. His father and brother were the ones to inform the Israeli authorities of his involvement in the attack. Matua, 28, married with two children, is said to be a member of the Islamic Jihad terrorist group. According to a report, the Hebrew language Ynet website, Matua told his brother Majidi that he had carried out the shooting. His brother then told their father, and the two decided to turn the shooter in <clears throat> to avoid a possible raising of their home <clears throat> by Israeli security forces. Security forces located the gun that killed the rabbi and his 18-year-old son, as well as the car used in the attack. The Shin Bet Security Service said in a statement that the suspect made comments during his initial investigation that implicated him in the attack. In a related story, responders say that the 16-year-old Littman, who had been shot in the leg, was lucid throughout the emergency call. When the operator asked him what direction the terrorist fled, he responded, heading south. There is a Palestinian Red Crescent ambulance here we have two casualties. There are seven of us in the car. The operator then asked him to clarify the condition of the wounded. One is wounded in the head, he answered, at which point his attention was distracted and he broke off, apparently due to the fact that the Palestinian ambulance he had spotted sped away instead of attempting to aid the wounded. <clears throat> There's a Red Crescent ambulance here, but he's driving away from us. I don't know why, the teen said. Well, following the reports that that Red Crescent ambulance passed by the site of Friday's deadly terrorist attack and ignored the victims as they lay dying, the Israeli government will be launching an international campaign against the Red Crescent organization, which in principle does not treat Jews, despite being bound to treat all casualties regardless of their identity. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu ordered the foreign ministry to lodge a stern complaint with the International Committee of the Red Cross in Geneva, under whose auspices the Red Crescent operates, demanding an explanation as to why the Palestinian ambulance ignored Israeli victims, contrary to all humanitarian and ethical practices. Security sources say this is far from the first such incident. Red Crescent ambulances and other Palestinian medics have, uh, have regularly ignored Israeli victims in need of treatment in what appears to be, be a matter of policy. In a deadly stabbing in October, which occurred <coughs> right outside a Palestinian medical clinic in Jerusalem's old city, Arab doctors and medics simply stood by while the Jewish victim uh, bled to death. And as other Arab passers-by abused the wife of one of the victims, as she attempted to escape with a knife still embedded in her back. Wow. That's atrocious. Okay, wow. so, so that's what we're fighting. It is. That's what we're fighting. So Jean-Claude. The mentality. Yes. <laughs> so what was it? What was what? What, what was it that, um, that you had said to me? And I'm not even so sure that that you didn't say it during a lie to the Southwest program. When you're I here, you yeah. we talk so much that yeah. I can never keep straight what we say on air and what we don't. Yeah. So what was it well, about France? I've been saying this for uh, about 15 years. So it's not new. It's not new. It's, it's part of um, what I believe God's redemptive purpose for France. Uh, and indeed, the, the rest of the church as a whole. I think the, the, the foundational reason for that happening in France, and I don't want to explain the why of that in terms of why, because it goes into too many details, but the reason is this. 
the church in the West, by and large, is mostly believing in a pre-tribulation rapture, which all, we all know is not biblical. Uh, the um, uh, something that happened to me in, in the late 90s in a prayer meeting in Florida, a prayer gathering. One of the ladies was there and she says, you know, Jean-Claude, I was in France for several years and there I established prayer groups in, nation, in the cities in France, in different houses. And I can't help but think that there is some things, some work that God cannot do in the world until he has done a work in France. And I thought, that's really interesting. Interesting. Yeah. And then a few, couple of years later, I was in England. I was addressing a group of, uh, of European prayer leaders. They had come from 38 nations uh, for a prayer convocation about Europe. And I was the only Frenchman there. And I addressed the group as to what I believe God's redemptive purpose for the nation of France is in terms of his global work. And uh, two of them from different nations came to me afterwards. And here is what each one of them said individually, separately. Jean-Claude, what you're saying, we also need. But I believe that there is some work that God cannot do in Europe until he has done a work in France. Really? And they both said that, and I thought, wow, very interesting indeed. It is. And so, we know all kinds of things talk, so here is what I believe God is doing. God is allowing the, the work to be done, in-depth work in France, to wake up the church in France, and to bring the church in France to the point where it is going to say, you know what, I thought we should have been up by now. Why are we still here? And God is allowing these things to rise now in order to call the church out of its lethargy, not only in France, but in the West as a whole. And those things are going to increase. Uh, I, had, I had told you that I believe that the Lord was going to start its work, uh, the persecution. And I say the Lord start the persecution because bottom line, he has final authority over everything. Okay? We know what he, we know he well, does. Well, I have to interrupt you and sure. say, if, if the Lord is, is allowing the persecution, we, we have to remember that everything that the Lord allows into our life, everything that he allows is always to bring us to him. Mm -hmm. That is always his ultimate goal. So whether yes. things are chocolate, <laughs> or terrorism. God's whole purpose in the whole big scheme of things is to bring us to him. Yeah. And so, if we don't, so he would allow that only to bring us to him. If we don't understand that, uh, I mean, it is good to understand, I should put it in a positive way, it is good to understand that whatever evil God allows, he has built in a redemptive purpose yes. for his work. Otherwise, he wouldn't allow it. Right. Okay? It's for us to take that redemptive purpose. The, uh, the necessity of the church in the West to realize that it has to wake up to the reality of the time, understand God's purpose for her during those days. So what I'm seeing this as, I'm seeing this as, as a movement of God and a, 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 a trigger, if you will, because the, it will be worse. Okay, this is not just the end of what is going to happen in France. Um, sadly, I, I, I believe it's only an appetizer. Mm -hmm. okay? There will be more coming. And so the church has to wake up because it has a crucial role to play during the tribulation to the Jew first. And so we're looking at, at, at very, very important times that we are living in right now. You know, Dad asked me, I don't know, it might have even just been yesterday, that... Uh, what do we do about the leadership in this country that is, doesn't seem to be um, doing what needs to be done? How are we going to fix that? The bottom line is the only way that we can fix that as a nation is to repent, to turn from our wicked ways, to, to yes. fall on our knees and to cry out to God. That's right. Because he puts an authority over us who he puts in authority over us 
to bring us to him. Mm -hmm. That's right. He, he can either use it to bless us or he can use it to correct us. Mm -hmm. That's how things work in, in God's economy. That's right. Yeah, he, uh, see, the, the, everything that's happening in Europe right now, and indeed here as well, because it's going to come here just as much, and you know that. Um, what has happened over the last decades, centuries actually, uh, France has gone farther and farther away from its roots of Judeo-Christian uh, belief. Uh, French is for, for all intents and purposes a secular state. Mm -hmm. And they are Catholic by birth, if you will. If you ask them what are you, we're Catholics. But it doesn't mean anything if, any more than if they were born in Iran, they'd be Islamist. You see, mm -hmm. it's an inherited trait. There, right. uh, it has lost its the dynamics of its belief and its foundation in the scriptures. And so what that has done, it has affected the spirit of France. And it's, be, it's created a, a, a spiritual vacuum that is now being filled with Islam. You know, when you realize in, in 68, there were 40, I think it was 48, 49 million people in France. And there were only 600,000 um, Algerians from this, from the uh, Algerian wars that had come for ref to refugee here. And now the numbers are varied so much <laughs> in terms of accuracy. Um, uh, we read anywhere from 8 to 13, 14 million uh, Islamists living in France. Uh, in the late 90s, France had established what they call no-go zones. The no-go zones are zones that are dangerous to approach. They were done because of, um, of crime, vandalism, thieves, uh, and so Areas maturity. they can't get a, a handle on. They can't get a handle on. So they were, they, there is a government website to that end. Okay, I, I was looking yes. at it again yesterday. Uh, 752 cities that are listed on this website. Okay, wait, Jean-Claude. 752 cities with mm -hmm. no-go zones in France alone. Mm -hmm. In France alone, yeah. And, and as I said, originally they were to, to say to people, you know, don't go in there because it's dangerous. But now more and more and more Muslims have entered into these areas and they live uh, pretty much uh, just like in England. They have Sharia law in England. They have 80 Sharia courts in London, I mean in England alone. So what we're seeing is, is an invasion that establish itself as a Trojan horse in, yeah. in Europe. It's not just France, it's Europe as well. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> when you look at some of the statements that, uh, that, the, that leaders of is in the Islamist world are, are making, simply that through the sheer reproduction, Europe, uh, France and Europe will be Islamist states within the next 30 years. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the statistics are clear. Right. France reproduces at 1.8 person per family. 1.8, they reproduce themselves. Islamists reproduce themselves at 6 to 8 per family. Mm -hmm. So how long does it take, do you figure, for, uh, you know? Mm -hmm. So in Belgium today, the, the most common names for new babies are Islamist names, mm -hmm. Mohammed and, so, and the like. Mm -hmm. Okay, I... Um I got an email the other day, and I want you to take a look at, at these pictures. And I want you to try to figure out what city this, this is. What city is this? I want you to look at. I want you to TV look at that one tennis. really, really closely. Okay. Look at that. It's in the middle of the street. It's Marseille, France. Third largest city in France. Mm -hmm. They have uh, twelve mosques in that city alone. Uh, in 74, there was one mosque in France. It was in Lyon. Now there are over 22 to 2,300 
places of worship, including mosques. And I have some in my webs, in my in my computer drawings, renderings of future projects for more mosques. And the government is facilitating that, interestingly mm -hmm. enough. So the first one was built in Lyon in 1974? Mm -hmm. That was the first mosque there was. And now there's over 2,200? 2,200 mosques and places of worship. And dozens and dozens uh, that are on the, on the planning for construction. Mm -hmm. the, France give them uh, ground in some areas, mm -hmm. they give them uh, funds to facilitate the construction. Uh, it's okay. okay, this might seem like kind of a strange question, but considering the fact that there's all of these no-go zones, and they're, I mean, they're so dangerous that nobody goes in there. Not even police. Not even the police, that's right, the police don't even go. Um, when they immigrate, when when they immigrate into a country, are are they assimilating with the country, or it doesn't look to me or sound to me like they, they do are. Not. They do not. They insist on their uh, on their laws to be implemented, and it, it's a gradual implementation. The today the schools in France uh, no longer serve pork. Okay, the uh, some of the. Uh, some of the uh, swimming pool in different na in different cities have certain hours for Islamic ladies to go in, and the rest of the population is not allowed to go in there. Uh, even other women? Oh yeah, no, even other women. Only Islamic ladies, because they cover themselves. They go into mm -hmm. this like uh, yeah, no, they're not allowed. And uh, it's uh, it's uh, a growth that is uh, that is very visible. My one of my cousin. Uh, lives used to she moved now but she lived up in uh, in the northern part of france and um, you know we ha in pharmacies in france what we do have is a green looking cross just like the red cross except it's green yeah. okay well mostly have petition to take that down because it offends them the oh, cross say, the cross and it's not even a one of the christian yeah, kind of right. cross you know they are uh, beginning to dismantle churches right now i, I got an email the other day uh, with a picture of a, of a French church completely being dismantled. And it's, uh, it's sad to see these things happening. But God has final authority on yes, everything. The other side of the issue is this, when we see so many refugees coming over, uh, th this is now another side that I believe the Lord is also doing. He's bringing all these people in Europe, in France, for what? Many of them, I believe, being fully are elect who one day will come to know the Lord. Mm -hmm. You see, we can't go to the nation to minister and right. witness. So God says, okay, I'm going to bring them to you. Mm -hmm. Yes, it will be <laughs> dangerous. Yeah. yeah, it will be dangerous. Yeah, we, yes, but we're going to demonstrate to them the love of Yeshua, the love of Jesus mm -hmm. to them. Well, we won't if, if uh, we're, we're not rock solid in our our beliefs of Christianity mm -hmm. and we know who we serve why we serve him and what he requires what he requires of us because he does require things of us he requires a change of heart he requires that we follow his rules and regulations so that we can you know become like him that's the point okay so yeah. I heard Did one. Did you? May, I'd say it again. That city, the second largest, the, the language is not French. But it's, it's probably Arabic. It's Arabic. Arabic, Arabic yeah. That's what yeah. caught my attention. Yeah. yeah, it's quite incredible. So, well, we're already out of time. Is your family safe in France? Yes. How's your mom? My mom is doing good. She's just kind of losing her, her memory quite a bit. She's going to be 93 in about, uh, about a month. And... Uh, but she's healthy. She's strong. Well, we really appreciate you joining us for this. You. And you Glad know what? We here. really love you. Remember, pray for the peace of Jerusalem and encourage all your friends and family to repent and get right with the Lord so that he can open our eyes and we can see what's Amen. going on.